Hey, I'm Jonathan, and I live in London, England. Hey, I'm Jeff, and I live in Perth, Australia. Together, we are Echo and Sidetrack. We produce music that sounds like this. And this. And even this. This podcast is about music, creativity, and everything in between the giant space that separates us. Welcome to A Band Apart with Echo and Sidetrack. Today's episode of A Band Apart with Echo and Sidetrack is brought to you by Short Order Burger Co. I, for one, believe it's the best burger in Perth, Australia. And whether you live in Perth and you haven't tried it or whether you're going to go to Perth and you're looking for the best burger, I advise you go to this place. They've got two stores, one on Hay Street in the city, 800 Hay Street, and one in Fremantle at 3 William Street. The Fremantle is a new store. It looks like an absolute vibe, great place to go for a drink and enjoy a big old burger. When you go into the store, mention the code word sidetrack and you'll get 10% off your order. That's a gift from us and a gift from Sure Order to you for listening to the podcast. Um, Yeah, go out there and enjoy a burger, yo. I feel nervous. No, I'm joking, I don't. Why? I've, I've built up to this day ever since I started listening to this podcast, I've... I've I've wondered when I was gonna be when I was gonna be asked to be on it. Would you say this is a dream come true? I mean, not one dream come true. Like years of dreaming has now come true on this day because I'm on this podcast. I'm glad that I could that we could offer you this. Was that your phone? Yeah, I'm gonna turn it off. That's you, really unprofessional. How many episodes of a podcast and you still don't remember to turn? I'm gonna turn mine off now. <laughs> I was um, editing last last week's episode and I actually heard it go off. And Jeff, like, it really fucks Jeff off. Like, <laughs> I can imagine Jeff getting pissed off at that. Man, he's he's really good with his, you know. He, like, he turns it off and he's just like, we're doing the podcast, but I'll often leave mine on. On today's episode, I'm joined by a very special friend, a very special person, because Jeff is doing some work to prepare for a set this weekend, with the, a show we have in Brisbane. So I asked if my good friend Max Linguistics could come and chat to me. E.g. MC Linguistics, E.g. Uh, Dr. Spin, uh, what, <laughs> what other names? Max, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell, me, tell, us what, tell us what you're about. Hello. Yes. I'm Jono's friend, <laughs> a man of many names. Uh, I, I, I hate introducing myself on things. I never know. I never know how to describe myself. Like whether it's like job interviews or CVs. Not that I've ever done very well at them. <laughs> but but <laughs> I never know how to intro myself. I'm a, I'm a friend of Jono's. That's my biggest accomplishment to date, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> You're 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 a you're an artist. You're a you're an MC. Yeah. You're a touring MC. Yeah. You write songs. Yeah, I write songs. I've done th- three EPs. Yeah, working on a load of new stuff at the moment. And you've got a song. You've got a song coming out on Friday with Document One. Yeah, I've got a song coming out with my good friends Document One, super talented producers, um, who I've known actually for a real long time. Um, they were kind of one of the first, the first DJs I ever really did a, a set with, um, way back in the day. Um, but yeah, we got um, I got a single coming out with them on Friday on Shogun. So actually, this ties in quite well because I can shout about it. <laughs> this is the first stop on the press tour that you're about to go on. Yeah, um, yeah, it's the first and only stop on the press tour. <laughs> no, you've booked in um, ITV. Yeah. Uh, well, Good Morning Britain next week. Yeah, well, Pierce Morgan's gone from <laughs> Good Morning Britain, so they, I'm going to go and plug my my stuff on there next week. Yeah, they're finally allowed to plug drum and bass on there. Yeah, they've been slacking on the drum and bass plugging on. I feel like some people, quite a lot of your listeners in, in Oz, are they going to know what <laughs> yeah. the fuck we're talking Probably about? Not. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, they'll know about the Pierce Morgan thing. but Yeah, Pierce Morgan got left his show because uh, he was insensitive to Meghan Markle's I mean he called she she said she was 
suicidal. Yeah, and he's called her a liar. So, I mean, it's just the most yeah fucked up response you can possibly give someone who's who's expressed those kind of feelings. It's pretty crazy. Oh, absolutely. Living in this country, I've seen, I've gotten like a little window into English culture. Mm. And like the tabloids and the media and the royal family is just such a like cacophony of bullshit, mm-hmm. essentially. Like it's so publicised and just like it's gross. I-, I find it very gross. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see while I'm in this country to see little cracks forming in the mm. monarch, if you will, if you think about the prince, the whole Prince Andrew being a nonce thing. Yeah. And now- Confirmed. This coming out about Harry and- um. What's, is her name Megan or Meghan? I think it's Meghan Markle. Meghan Markle. Yeah. Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan, yeah. Leaving the royal family and yeah. this interview with Oprah. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, I just never really cared that much about the royal family, like enough to like them or dislike them. But yeah. I think, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that's coming out recently, you know, particularly the way they handled the... The Prince Andrew stuff is just, it's mad to me. I wonder whether they're super behind in how they think the world consumes information and they still think that they can just kind of not address something and not deal with it. Um, and it would, the problem will just go away. That's, that kind of just doesn't happen anymore because, because people will, people definitely haven't forgotten about the Prince Andrew thing. Like you, no. you see, it's slat- any anytime any kind of, any anything bad comes comes up and the royal royal family have to deal with it. That's 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 there. That's no people aren't forgetting that. Um and I think the you know, the way they've allegedly probably bullied Meghan and Harry, uh, you know, that people won't forget that either. But it's definitely like I mean, people are torn. Like I'm I'm definitely on the side of Meghan and Harry, uh, without a doubt. But I saw some poll yesterday that said the country was split. But I think that's very. I think it's. I think it's likely that the kind of older generation are still very much like, yeah, British royal family, we love that shit. And yeah, um, you know, if you're below the age of forty, you're probably less likely to care. They're probably also the older people would probably be like, we've all gone through troubles in our life. You know, you, you've just got to pull your bootstraps up and deal with it. Yeah. Sure, she felt a bit sad, but, you know, yeah, everyone feels sad from time to time. Like, you're just absolutely not understanding anything about mental health. Yeah, it is totally. They're from the generation of, you know, just pull, pull yourself together, you know. Yeah. It's, um, Eat a couple of roast potatoes and you won't be depressed anymore. Exactly. Just have some beef and gravy and some carrots. Whereas our generation, uh, I don't know, I like to think a lot more experienced and sympathetic and evolved in the way they think about mental health issues and just generally issues around the whole world, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I would I would agree with that. I can even tell that, like, if I have discussions with my parents about stuff, mm-hmm. it's clear that I'm... And I don't even think that I'm particularly, like, woke or super aware of a bunch of stuff, but I have conversations with my parents about social issues and that kind of thing. And it's just kind of beyond their um, their world so much. Mm-hmm. Like our worldview is just so wide. Yeah. But with, with the internet and with social media and that type of stuff. And, and theirs is just a lot smaller. And I mean, I yeah. Yeah. It's not, an, it's not exactly an excuse for not being uh, more aware of stuff, but I, I kind of understand um, that they're not. I suppose, I don't know, it kind of works both w- ways it kind of works to our advantage in a way that we have access to more information and more mediums to access that information but then also like that becomes a an issue for us as well because we're given all of this data that our brain can't you know which way do we go we almost have Mm. we almost have too much on our plate for to make a to make our decision and form i think it's really difficult to form opinions um, but just based on what we have, because I, I'm not articulating this properly. <laughs> but 
But you know what I mean? Like, because, because there's, <laughs> it's really difficult for me to form opinions. So I just, <laughs> I just, I just don't, uh, no, um, but no, but because we have so much available to us, we're almost drowning yeah. in jamming yeah. and stuff. Absolutely. It's an information overload. <laughs> 100%. You can't like have a job, have a hobby and be the most informed person in the world. Like if you want to be the most informed person and you want to spend a lot of your day on Twitter or Facebook and like calling out people and throwing down facts and all this stuff, you you have to be like just a news junkie and mm. double checking sources and like reading articles all day. Like I, d- I know I don't have fucking time for that. Yeah. I've got so much better and more interesting shit to do. <laughs> <laughs> that I would much prefer just to either make up facts, misremember facts, or just be like, I listened to this on a podcast somewhere and I'm pretty sure this is true. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm way happier to come across as a bit stupid than spend all my time trying to be right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, exactly. Obviously, you don't want to come across as stupid, but yeah, I mean, I yeah, completely agree. I, everyone's got that, you know, one or two people on their Facebook feed who... Like, I don't understand how they, number one, spend so much time writing these really, really long, usually pretty informative. Yeah. And and things I agree with, they're like articles. Like Yeah. They're, they're, they're usually really well written. Yeah, really, really well written. It is like reading an article, but it's just it's on someone's status. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's, I, yeah, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to do that. I'm, I'm just not articulate enough. I, you know, I have my views and I spout them off, and they're probably <laughs> probably bullshit sometimes. But <laughs> but I enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's all that fucking matters. I had a big un- unfollow spree on Instagram the other day. I was following like a thousand, well, over a thousand people. Like I didn't even realize it's like. I was, and I just kind of thought, like, how the fuck am I following that many people? And how, why, why do I, why, why do I do? Why, what's the point in following that many people? Like, you, yeah. you, there's no way you need, you, no, no way you can consume that amount of people's content from their lives and it mean anything to you. No, uh, not at all. So I follow. I'm yeah. I'm, there was loads of just fucking random people. I think I got it down to like 500 and I still don't know how I'm going to do follow 500 people's lives. <laughs> it's still too much. But but I don't, there's the whole like issue with unfollowing people is if you unfollow someone and then they see you've unfollowed, then they, they'll, you know, when you see them, they'll just be, do people take real fucking offense to unfollowing? Like, would you, do you, would you care if someone unfollowed you? No. I mean, if it was someone that I really liked. Yeah, like me. <laughs> yeah, like if you yeah. unfollowed me, I would. Yeah. One, I, I don't think I'd know because I don't follow you. No, I'm, I, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I'd get notif- notif- uh, notification about it. I think you you just disappear. The thing is, people like, if I unfollow someone on social media, that doesn't mean that I don't like them in real life. It just means that yeah. their social media thing is just not what something I want to follow or be a part of. Yeah. I feel like people, a lot of people are probably myself included, have a different kind of persona online than they do in real life. And I think that's just humans as a whole. I don't think people, I don't, I don't think a lot of people project their true. We we all know people don't project their true lives and true selves on social media. It's not fucking real. Uh, Can I swear on this, by the way? No. Okay. It's not bleeping. Of course it's not. (laughs) It's not bleeping real. No, of course you can swear. You can say whatever you want. It's not real. So, yeah, I don't know. If someone unfollowed me, even if it was like uh, like a close friend, I would. I don't think it would bother me. I wouldn't take it personally. No, I, I don't think you can. Social medially, I would take it <laughs> with extreme offence and I would do everything I could to fuck up their social media and get it <laughs> hacked. But in real life, I, you know, we're cool. <laughs> yeah. You start just a purely social media vendetta against that person. But you're completely fine with the person in real life. <laughs> I would, I mean, I would ask them, like, if it was one of, if it was someone I'm friends with, I'd be like, hey, you unfollowed me, like, why? I was just wondering why. 
If they're like, oh, it's just like I'm not interested in seeing what you're posting about whatever, your music or whatever. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. That's fine. Because I do that. Like I've had friends uh, that maybe change their personal account into like a business account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For their new venture. And then they just post a lot because that's what you have to do when you have a business on social media. Yeah. And I just don't want to learn or see heaps of stuff about your special creams or whatever you're selling. So I just yeah. unfollow that person. I'm like, I'm not interested. I take need to need to take that into consideration. I'm talking about if people unfollowed my like if it was like a me, my music account. Like okay. The, the linguistics thing where I just post pictures of crowds and you know, there's I suppose there is stuff of like my most of, there's a fair bit of actual life on there. But 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 I would under I would understand why if one of my friends who isn't who isn't involved in the music industry just got a bit bored and was like oh you know I just I was I was all, all I was getting is was just shots of you from crowds constantly or whatever and I, you know I, that wouldn't bother me because no. because I see that as the same way you're talking about if your friend makes a hand cream business or a plant pot business or I don't know yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's not them, so it's like I didn't I didn't agree to follow this. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, unless it's like something that I really do enjoy, mm. like if the con- basically the rule should just be if the content serves you, then keep following them. Yeah, totally. But if it doesn't, stop following them. Like I I I need to go do another cult because I I mean I think I'm still following this guy that I met in a nightclub in 2010. (laughs) Yeah. And we just like, I think I was buying a shot of Black Sambuca and he was like, Black Sambuca is fucking sick. And I was like, yeah, bro, (laughs) Black Sambuca is sick. And we just had a few shots of Black Sambuca and like maybe tried to like talk to girls together for the night or something. Like we we just spent like a couple of hours as you yeah, do yeah. in nightclubs. Yeah. Everyone's got those people. <laughs> we like added on Facebook and then threw that on Instagram. And then like I saw that he had his second child the other day. And I, I don't even fucking know this guy's name right now. I could like, he comes up on the feed, but I, I do not know who he is. I don't know who his wife is. I don't know yeah. anything about him. Yet I still, he's still on my Instagram. Yeah, it's so random, man. <laughs> there's too many people like that yeah yeah i someone was telling me uh the other day they they had a friend well n- like not a friend a person who they met at letter roll like hammered whatever years ago hadn't seen anything of them online and then literally for for years and then a couple of months ago this dude comes up in their Instagram or Facebook feed and just start spouting anti-vaxxer shit. <laughs> just like, what the, who is this dude? And then he was like, oh yeah, it's that guy from the fucking campsite and let it roll. It's just, uh, uh, cold, cold stuff from your life that, that doesn't serve a purpose. It yeah, just, absolutely. Yeah. It's, we're, we're too overloaded. Our brains are too busy. And, um, yeah, there's no shame in there's no shame in that. People shouldn't be made to feel bad about trying to no. trying to get rid of stuff from their lives that doesn't add to their being as a human. No, it's strange that we like. I mean, we try to stay off social media as much as possible, but unfortunately, in our business, it's like a necessary evil. Do you think you'd have it if if you didn't ha- if you didn't do music? Do you think you'd? Yeah, I mean, I've still got a personal. I've still got a personal Instagram. Like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh wait, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah, I did. <laughs> That's the one you don't follow. Um, what? Do I oh no, follow? you started following. No, you started following me like a week ago or something. No way. You don't follow my yeah. personal one either. No one even knows about my personal one. That's a secret. You got a personal no, one? Joking. Yeah. Wow, this is a admission. <laughs> no, a live podcast admission. I Max Linguistics <laughs> has a personal Instagram page. If you can search it and find it. You can win two free tickets to our next show. Um, is that an act- actually going to be a... Sure, why not? <laughs> okay, I found it. Can I have two tickets, please? <laughs> um, but, like, I wouldn't care about it, 
but I'd have it because I'd probably I'd probably have it and just share more um photography stuff. Yeah. That I like. Yeah. That's I, why I should probably I should probably do that anyway. Yeah, you should do that. What do you but share on what do you share on your personal one now? Mostly just like film photos. Oh, uh, is it like a Oh yeah, it's pretty Yeah, it's pretty arty. What's this cat? <laughs> <laughs> I just loaded up your Instagram. There's <laughs> this moody ass cat. Did you ever meet? No, um, what is that your Wilson? cat? No, no. Nah, so, so that's when I was living in um, <laughs> when I was living in Broccoli. Oh my god, this cat looks like Winston Churchill. His, I used to call him Winston accidentally. His name's Wilson. <laughs> um, and he's like the Brooks Brothers cat because I was staying at um. This is Brooks Brothers. This is like it's Dan. Yeah. No way. I was like, it's it's Nick. Like, it's Dan's younger brother, Nick, his cat, but it's like the family cat. That is an awesome, awesome cat. Yeah, I kind of like inherited the house and therefore the caring of, of Wilson. Amazing. He got me through He got me through lockdown one. Really? Yeah. How, um, what did you find worse? What, what, <laughs> walk down? Lock- walk down one or walk down two? <laughs> what lockdown are we on now? Is it three or four or two? I think this is three. Okay, that's a good. Didn't we go on a circuit? When was the circuit breaker one? The circuit breaker one was in December, right? No, we we're open in December. I don't know. Uh oh, there was that time when everything was split into tiers, and they split the country yeah. in different tiers, and people in Bristol could go for a pint, but if you're in London, you couldn't. Uh, I think that was in was that December, and then they and then they pretty much shut it all down for Christmas. Yeah, we went into full lockdown in January again. I think. Yeah. Third lockdown. Yeah, third lockdown. I, this one's 100% the shittest one out of all of them. You reckon? Yeah, this one sucks, Bran. I hate it. Um, the first one, I'd, I'm not going to lie, I quite liked it. <laughs> Especially the first, like, two months. Yeah, because, the, man, the first one was then, like, it was like a, it was like a holiday. Yeah, it kind of was. Like, I've... Saying that from a very privileged position because um, I managed to get a bit of help from from our government. Um, yeah, so, if you, so that if was you were very thankful. Furl- if if you know if, if you if you're you furloughed, yeah, if you're furloughed, you're 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 probably pretty silently going yes under your breath. Yeah, but, uh, if not, then you know it was a it was a it was a troubling time. But but um, yeah. I mean, regardless of that, I think I think. Even before we, even before like the furlough or any support was announced, I remember, I remember going for a walk and just thinking, uh, like this is the probably the calmest I've felt in a in a really long time, because it just took the stress of the world away pretty immediately. And I think I I re- didn't realize how kind of uh, like st- not stressed, but probably slightly close to burning out a bit and pretty mm. just running on adrenaline constantly basically and it wasn't mm. until that kind of went away and the world shut down that I was like oh this is what calm feels like yeah and do you think you've been able to maintain that over the past year yeah definitely i think that's one thing i think that feeling of calm um and that prolonged feeling of calm was like a bit of a reminder for me um that i i don't want to go back to how i was feeling before yeah before we all went into lockdown at all um did you ha- like you know because we, we opened up a bit um <laughs> we opened up a bit in uh july i want to say august yeah july. yeah yeah july to, so yeah. W- did you feel like you know it didn't go back to normal at all but there were a couple of tastes of tastes of normality yeah if you will yeah in july people were were mixing outdoors a bit yeah um and it you you were able to see people um slightly more more often in a more relaxed environment um i'm i guess i'm thinking about that day that we went um and got pissed mm-hmm. at <laughs> when i went to the tate Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, that was wicked. Yeah, and and you know things like going to um, Seb's party. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wait. What? So because like that that was in yeah you could September. do that yeah we, so you could kind of like 
there was a time when it was kind of back to normality and there was... Slight, yeah, it was slightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Seb, Seb's party was in there. Did you feel like, you know, going to that first lockdown, you slow down, the calmness of life starts to bleed in and then as that first lockdown was coming to an end mm. and it started to ramp back up, you know, you're seeing more people, talks of like festivals and music kind of kind of coming back before we knew it wasn't going to come back. Yeah. Did you feel stressed at that idea or were you like, I've, I've had the breather and now I'm ready to dive back underwater, but I'm just not going to go as deep? Uh, I can't really remember. I think, I think by that point I, I was really, really missing shows. Like I always miss doing yeah. shows anyway, but like at the beginning I was, I was kind of happy to just chill for a bit and hope that shows would come back in a few months. But by, by the time that September came and realized that that was just not a, it was not going to happen. I can't really remember how I, how I felt about it. It's weird. It's kind of odd because it's been, I've had the calm and, but then it, I kind of have been up and down since that. Mm. I think it changed from day to day. One day I was like, oh, this is good that things are opening up a little bit and there's maybe a sense of normality. But then then another day I'd be super overwhelmed and worried about what shows were going to be like. Um, you know, the safety of people, how pe are they going to be able to keep people safe? So there's, I think that, I think, I think since September up right until now, is just is just up and down wave of emotions and they they change um yep. depending on a number of factors on how you're feeling on that day and that's that's now i just i take everything a day at a time and try not to panic if i'm hmm. if i'm not feeling excited when i feel like i should be feeling excited or that i should be feeling sad when i that like i'm feeling sad when i shouldn't be feeling sad or you know yeah what about you I think um, I've felt the worst in December. Yeah. I was thinking about this um, when I chatted to my friend back home this morning. I was like, I think I felt my my lowest in December, January. Mm -hmm. which, I, which I credit to seasonal, what is it, SADS? Seasonal Affective Disorder. Seasonal Affective Disorder. A bit... Um, but also just like it just get it all getting a bit long <laughs> it all getting yeah. a bit long and there was some there's some there was some kind of personal issues that we were dealing with mm -hmm. at the time and i feel like coming off the back of that i've actually felt quite a lot better in the past month yeah it, i mean the whole thing has been up and down since about a year ago cuz it's now coming up to like fucking in three days it would be a year since um i contracted COVID. wow it's mad it's mad out it's crazy it's a year it, it's it, it's just it's in, it's really insane yeah the first one felt like a bit of a holiday for a short portion of time and a bit fun and then the reality of it set in at, at the beginning of the last one i wasn't i wasn't working i was just i had savings so i was like mm. i think i had about a month or something of of not working. I was actually doing some um, production tutorials, one-on-one -on -one sessions over Zoom yeah. with some guys. And I remember being like, this is like, this is cool. I can settle in mm -hmm. to this. Uh, and then I kind of realized that I needed more money yeah. and started working. Once you get that taste of normality with work, but you're still going home to an empty house and you can't see anyone, it's kind of like, yeah, shit. You were you were on your own for a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's course. why I said Wilson was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, a, a savior because he was like my little buddy. I could talk to. Yeah. If he shot on the ground, I could shower him. I could shave him. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> which I didn't do for fun, but I just did out of necessity. Yeah. But like, it was it was weird to have a kind of taste of normality, but then have such an abnormal thing on the side. I remember I remember clearly going to work one day and then the next day I had to go shopping and you lined up for the shops and everyone was wearing um gloves and masks. 
And I think it's the one one time I wore plastic gloves to the shops. Maybe one of the first times I went to the shops. I mean, I remember buying like a fucking kilo, like three kilos of rice or something, being like, okay, if- Were you one of the people who was ruining all the shops? No, but I went to the shops when people were, ru- were ruining it and I yeah. felt like, you know, look, I'm I'm only buying a fucking- six pack of beer and some cigarettes and something else <laughs> but i may as well also buy a pound of flour and a pound of rice just in case yeah 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 but there were man when i did that there were people buying like so yeah, obviously the toilet paper debacle was ridiculous oh my yeah wow that was a that was a they were just going crazy on everything i remember like sainsbury's <laughs> was like bare the like yeah. everything was bare everything was there was no pasta uh, in our, no. in our, in our, I feel like in our Sainsbury's, the one just up the road from where I am now, it's a big, a big Sainsbury's. There was, uh, like, there. I feel like there was uh, two or three weeks where <laughs> we were lucky to get a, a thing of pasta. If, if when we went there, they were usually just all gone. Uh, that kind of blew my mind. I just didn't really, I didn't really understand the the madness of that. And also, what the fuck have the people done with all the shit they took? Is there people with like containers full of toilet roll? Yeah, th- they just haven't used. They're just gonna. What do they do? Sell them back? Just they just hold it. They ho- they put it in the shed and they just hold it for a rainy day. I mean, I feel for them because you're not gonna do that unless you genuinely feel that you are that scared and worried about things. So in a way, yeah. I'm thankful that I I didn't experience that. F- fear to that level and anxiety yeah. to that level that I felt that I had to go out and do that to absolutely to I suppose guess most people are trying to protect themselves and their families aren't they in that situation but yeah man I just yeah I, I'm glad I didn't ever do that I think it's interesting and kind of telling um how we feel about shit and going to the toilet in general to to know that like the people's number one priority was to make sure that they could wipe their wipe, ass. wipe their ass in a fucking pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Like worst case scenario, splash some water on it. Yeah, exactly. Or use a towel or you know, there's <laughs> there's <laughs> splash some water. There's <laughs> a there's a workaround. Yet people were like if this thing goes tits up, we're going to need at least 2000 pounds of toilet paper. Yeah. And while you're at it, <laughs> I like eating pasta while I wipe my ass. So get a load of that. <laughs> All I need is pasta and toilet paper. <laughs> Coming out of um, of this one, because obviously there's now a roadmap to normality yeah. that's been released by the government. Mm-hmm. How has that made you feel since the announcement? So, um, I'm, I mean, purely based on the fact that the, our government have just handled the the whole thing in a pretty terrible way, um, and you know we've been told various things at various points um, that things are going to happen and they haven't. So I'm 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 cautious about getting getting too excited mm-hmm. um, about it, but then also I don't want to stop myself from experiencing a bit of excitement because I think that's needed. So I'm, I'm managing my expectations. Um, it's obviously, it's great. But the thing is my main, my main thing is I want to go see my mum. I want to go see my sister. I want to go see my yeah. nephew. I want to yeah. hug my mum, hug my family. That's what I really, that's what I really want. Um, everything else with shows and festivals and going to the pub and stuff like that is, obviously something I want to do, but my main priority is the family stuff. Um, So if we can get to a point where, where that's possible, that's the thing I'm more excited about. And that's what, that's what matters to me for the government roadmap. If we can get that, if what they're saying is going to, if their whole roadmap thing is accurate and we can come out of this, then then in the time frame they, they think we can, then then great because it will mean that I can go and see see those people who are, who mean the most to me. How long has it been since you've seen your mum or your sister? So, I've been I've been for like walks walks with my mum, like out outside. We've had a couple of walks. Um, she's she's been 
she's been you know super super nervous about it all, which is mm-hmm. uh, you know fair enough. You know she's she's slightly older. Um, I would say she's one hundred one hundred and fifty years old. She's uh, yeah, she's like eight hundred and ninety two years old. Yeah, she's like Gilgamesh <laughs> or no Methuselah in the Bible. So your mum is nearly a thousand years old. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> She'd kill me if she heard me say that. My mum's not a thousand years old and she doesn't look a thousand years old. She doesn't act a thousand years old. There's nothing about her that's a thousand years old. She looks fantastic. She's useful. She's she's beautiful. Yeah, she's, she's fantastic. She's amazing. She's, she's fantastic. Uh, but she, understandably, she's uh, she's been slightly, she's been more nervous and worried about yeah, for sure. the, the, you know, the potentially, you know, the potentially devastating effects of, of, um, of COVID. So, yeah. Um, so we, so yeah, well, I mean, we haven't, we haven't seen each other properly for, you know, almost a year. Okay. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back to, to being able to see her. And also like, m- like my nephew, my nephew's, um, we won in a bit and God, my brain is terrible. Yeah. I think he's, he's won in a bit and he, um, and I've missed a big part of his life, you know, him growing up. Um, so I, I want to get back to be able to be in a, a part of his life as well. So, so yeah, they're the kind of, they're the main things, but yeah, I'm babbling now. <laughs> you feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. It looks, it, it, it looks, it looks, it looks to be so like, yeah. I mean, everything with the vaccine rollout seems to be going, going well. My mum's had the vaccine. She gets her second jab, uh, April, April 20th, I think. So that'll that'll be a big relief. So I think I think I think there'll be a lot of change over the the coming months. I don't know mm. if we'll get out of it as quick as the government are saying we will. I think there's mm. there's always stuff that can go wrong and things happen unexpected. That's one thing the last year has definitely taught us. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm cautious and it, I'm cautiously excited. Um, okay. But not sh- not completely blocking off the excitement because I think that you know if it is possible, I think you should be a bit excited and people need to be excited. Yeah, um, it's important. And that's the, I mean that's what's giving people. I mean that's hope, mm-hmm. isn't it? Because the idea, if the government came out and were like, "Well, staying locked down until June," mm. people would be like, "What the fuck?" Yeah. But this glimmer of hope is kind of what. I think what the country needs. Yeah. And what really what the world needs. Like Yeah, totally. There's got to be some sort of reprieve from this. Mhm. And I I mean that, I guess that's one thing that I'm excited to go back home and enjoy, like Yeah. Normality. I mean, you've had a hell of a ride since you got here. Cuz yeah, When hard. did you when did you arrive? September 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you had like a few months of kind of life here. Yeah. And then just, man, <laughs> that, that is a unique <laughs> travel experience. <laughs> I mean, ah, uh, yeah. I mean, you've got a story for life there. Like when your grandkids are like, what did you do when you went traveling, granddad? And you're like, well, there was a fucking pandemic in <laughs> London. <laughs> and they dealt with it worse than any other country in the world. So we were super bad. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your fondest memories of being being here are going to be? I mean, I mean, just all the times that I've spent with people mm. that I love. Mm. Meeting new people, mm. laughing, spending time with you. Yeah. Spending time with Seb, spending time with Luke. Yeah. Um just funny times, man. Spending time with Jake. Yeah. Rob. Just like just being able to being able to call someone who previously I would only see once a year. Yeah. And being like, Do you want to go down to the pub? Yeah. And be like, Yeah. And that has been like beautiful to me because like obviously I I want to see and get to know and like become better friends with all these people and and being here has allowed me to do that. And, and like, yeah, yeah. Just, just any times that I've done that, I'm trying to think of specific times. 
<coughs> donut runs. Donut runs. Donut runs have been pretty <laughs> fucking good. Yeah, they have been good. Man, like, uh, I was thinking the other day, um, I did pretty well to fit quite a lot of interesting shit into my life in a quite a short amount of time. Like, I got to I got to go to Printworks. Mm-hmm. I got to go to Ministry of Sound. We played Fabric. Yeah. I still got to experience some some of the interesting, some of the things that, that being in London and living in London have to offer. Yeah. One of my favourite nights was actually probably going to Printworks. Yeah, that place I is was crazy. From, it was for the Ram Night and I was filming for Culture Shock and we just were drinking and laughing and I think I went out to a F45 party. The the F- The gym. The gym, the, the gym had like its, um, it was the end of the challenge. So, F45 right, right. challenge is like 45 days of, you know, you're supposed to eat really well and go by this plan and stuff and, and I was doing it. And then the night of the end of challenge party was the same night as um, James was playing at Printworks. So, I went to Printworks, had drinks, had lots of laughs and then got dropped off at a pub and met up with all of the fucking F forty five people and went crazy. You had like a you had like a double, a double. Man, I had like three celebrations. We went back to one of the guys' house after, and it was just like <laughs> a continuation of the party. It oh, was man. just like it was it was such a great night. <sighs> Do you feel like I feel like when I whenever I get into speaking about memories like that now because it's been so long since I've had like a night out like that. Like it feels re- I get really visual. Like when you were yeah. when you were just explaining that story, I was like looking at the screen, just like I'm in I'm in Printworks right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to this F forty five party, bro. <laughs> like, well, I can even see what the after party house looked like, even though I've never been there. <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, it's it's mad. Uh, it's it's it's, it's, oh, it's like crazy. remembering a dream at this point. Yeah, like, it's fucked. I was watching a, a, a an after movie this morning. It just came up on my Facebook memories. A reminder. It was the last. I think it was the last show. Maybe second last show. Me and Ed did. It was later roll winter in Prague. And I was yeah, just watching this. I watched this minute loop for about twenty minutes in bed this morning. Just like, oh, what the hell? I can't even believe that. It doesn't feel like I did that. And mm-hmm. I'm looking at pictures of me, videos of me on on the stage. Yeah, like going mad. And I just, <laughs> it's it's hot. It's kind of. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's hard to process because it kind of, you're looking at something that is clearly you, but you don't feel like you you did that because the uh, it's so detached to what your reality is right now. Yeah, it's cra- it's weird how you can become so detached from experience so quickly. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's odd. I don't know. I, I don't know whether it would change if I watched it more, but yeah, it's kind of hard watching it all and not knowing when it will happen again. When I went to Cologne and played a show in November last year. Oh, yeah. You had that show. Which was very lucky. Um, I remember playing and being like, this is the greatest thing. Like, this is like a fucking life-changing experience. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking and messaging Jeff afterwards being like, this is what's been missing kind of like the, like I need this type of stuff. Yeah. Like I, I have to play loud music in front of people. Mm-hmm. Or like there's like it needs to be that performance um aspect or something. And it's like this has been the missing piece of the puzzle that I that I haven't had. Yeah. But again it's like you have a taste of that and then it goes again. It goes and you you kind of you miss that feeling, but you, the, the feel, you know, like the fit. Okay. So when you, I'm trying to explain this, I'm trying to explain the feeling, you know how, when you come, you feel <laughs> the orgasm, right? You feel it. I don't know. It's then, never happened for me. And, <laughs> and then straight after, it's like you instantly forget how that feels like or exactly what it feels like. It's hard to describe. It's It's like a, it's kind of like this mystical moment that's very difficult to describe. That's how I feel about the last time I played a DJ set. Oh, yeah, you can use that analogy. I'm going to use the analogy of when you're ill 
and you can't remember what it feels like to not feel ill. Yes. It's that. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> do you ever do like. that when you like, have, All the time. when you're just ill and then you're like, oh, I just want to know what it feels like to not feel like this and you can't, yeah, I get what you mean. You make promises, you make so many promises. You're like, oh, if I get better, I'll never smoke a cigarette again or like, I'll <laughs> never eat bad food or I'll never do this and then you get better and you're like, let's go out and get fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, is it? I mean, it's interesting what you were saying about um, how when you did the you did the show in Cologne, it made you feel like I was coming on stage. You know? <laughs> <laughs> is that what it was? Did you come in your pants while you were in Cologne? Is that I what did. Happened? I double dropped our our latest single, <laughs> D- Discipline, and then I shot a load into my <laughs> pants. <laughs> What happens every time I play our songs actually in sets. God, you're so Fun f- little you're so Easter egg. Fucking, you're so fucking arrogant. I know, right? I love it. <laughs> and it's only your tunes that make that. Only happen. our tunes. <laughs> only our songs. No, but I was, I was, <laughs> I was just, like, if you don't do something for so long, you can forget how important it is to you. Yeah, totally. Like th- th- this week, like releasing music again, it's the first time I've released a track um, for. I think like nearly a year. I mean, and also it being my release, I've done features, but I haven't released one of my own tunes for a couple of years. Yeah. And that's, you know, plenty of time to place a lot of doubt in my, myself, I think of being like, you know, should you really be doing this? You know, you know, you know, just around music in general and whatever. But like this last couple of weeks is like the, you know, started the the releases, the release dates got nearer and nearer. Yeah, and I started all the promo and stuff for it. That that's I've it's had this, a similar effect on me. Like your gig, the way your gig kind of made you reminded you that you need to do this and this is what you mm. should be doing. The build up to the release that's happening on Friday has kind of done that for me as well. And it's yeah, it's like a it's a reminder, isn't it? It kind of kick. It kickstarts that part of your brain that has laid dormant for a little bit. Yeah. But it's weird how quickly we can detach ourselves from something that's clearly really integral to our, like, our being and how, you know, who we want to be as people and what we, how, what we want to live our lives doing. It's a pretty major thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a, almost like a coping mechanism. Mm. Like, your mind subconsciously goes, okay, I know you're not going to be able to do this thing for an, like a certain period of time. So we're just going to shut off that valve mm-hmm. and just forget about it a little bit. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's an interesting take. I think that's I think there's definitely a lot of truth in that. It's like a it's like a self-preservation thing. Yeah. So, you know, if I don't think about that too much and I don't associate that to be such an important thing, um and I suppose it's your it's your value, isn't it? Every, pretty much everything you you value about yourself stems from being an artist and the art you put out to the world. So once that's taken away and it's out of your control, as a coping mechanism, as you say, that's what your 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 mind is going to do. Yeah, it's just going to try and sh- try and shut it shut shut it out. I wonder whether that's yeah, it's, it's probably what's happened really. And I, I'm sure there's people that have like dealt with it better than better than I probably have. I mean, you just um, deal with it terribly, man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do deal with it terribly. I like I think I'm really it's, joking. I think like there's been people that have been really productive mm. and like that can kind of push through that that resistance. Yeah. Um but I'm I'm t- I'm trying to get better at doing that. And I think it's just been very difficult. I mean, it's been a fucking weird year. There is such a unique experience for everyone um, going through this whole thing that we've all we're all going through and have been through in the last year. It's not, it's not one of those ones. I like, I have a friend who who um, uh, who runs a business, and and she was saying um, how she you know she was worried because looking back, refl- reflecting on stuff, looking back and seeing what other people have done. There's things that she could have done with her business to yeah. adapt, adapt to things and, you know, do whatever. And I just, I said to her, I was like, now 
now is not the time to be looking at, at you know comparisons of what other people have done and and trying to and, and beating yourself up about things it's just it's just not at all um some people some people will have dealt with it some people will have dealt with it by getting getting stuck in and you know battling battling through it every day and sitting in the studio for you know 22 hours a day and doing that that's some people's coping mechanism personally that's not mine if i mm. to avoid to avoid me going into deep depression and going to a place where i don't where i've been before and i know i don't ever want to go again i have to really really take care of myself and a lot of taking care of my, myself i know is isn't stressing myself isn't putting my body through stress of not, not sleeping right and you know probably not eating correctly and you know not exercising it's you know it's doing all of it's having all that sort of stuff under control and being mm. kind being kind to myself and saying if you want to chill today chill today and don't feel bad yeah um and I'm, I'm not i'm not very i'm not i'm good at it sometimes but sometimes i'm not but yeah i yeah i mean I, I say the same thing to you that i say to said to my friend like don't you can't be looking at what other people have done in the last year and if they have written 15 albums and they come out and they're all great good for them like who gives a fuck at least you're here and you're present and you're and you're happy that's that's all that matters man yeah I mean, that's, it's very true that everyone's coping mechanism is very different. Mm. Probably one of the things I've probably learned is that in the past, how unhealthy my coping mechanism could be. Yeah. Like, and that's probably a major difference between this lockdown and the last lockdown. Yeah, like, yeah. The coping mechanism of, you know, more booze. Yeah. Al- alcohol is definitely like a huge coping mechanism for me. Yeah, yeah. And that's been less present in this lockdown because I've kind of been so aware of how much I would reach for a bottle of wine. Yeah. After a tough day. Um so yeah, I mean it, it, you're right. You're totally right. It is subjective and you can't compare your scenario or your situation rather to anyone else's experience. Yeah, totally. It's fully unique. Yeah. Unique just like you. A what? Unique just like you. Unique just like everyone. Everyone, literally everyone is unique. Damn, that is that is just dropping knowledge. <laughs> I'm, joking. <laughs> I'm really joking. Unique like everybody. Wow. <laughs> mind blown. Wanna get wow. your, what, yo, wanna get your mind blown? You're not the same as anyone else on earth. Oh. oh. Oh, man. Jeez. I can't stand shit like that. <laughs> what? Like super positive? Nah, not. Or like fake? Nah, like fake, fake woke. Fake, fake woke, woke. Fake wokeness. It just does my nut. Like, you know, when someone says, like, <laughs> I know, yeah, something literally like what we just said. They think it's mad profound, but it's actually just what it is. It's like that, but that is all. It's always in like the way they say it. It's like this toast has peanut butter on it, <laughs> so therefore it's, it's gonna taste like peanuts. <laughs> it's like no fucking. <laughs> it's amazing that if you you can say anything like that and it sounds super profound. Yeah, if you and if you say you use like the word eyes or something like that in it, it makes it even sound even more. Your eyes are your eyes only. Wow. <laughs> you see the world through your eyes. No fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, they're, they're, they're all things that are like, duh. Like they're, <laughs> yeah. they're like a duh thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's just... you, can only, you can only breathe one second at a time. And then no shit. <clears throat> oh, my God. But if it's written in nice font behind a flowery image, yeah, <laughs> then actually people, you know, there's the cynical part of me that's just like, fuck off to all that stuff. But there's also a part of me that has been having a bad day and I come across someone being like, just like, hey, take, a, take a breath because it's one breath of a million or something. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, 
And you do it, you do it, or you, you something, something, something like this moment is not forever. Something like that. Yeah. It's like, oh no, shit. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of. I know, I know what you mean. I have to remind myself sometimes not to be so cynical, so cynical about things. But I, yeah. also, my cynicism comes from a place of. I, like, I find uh, like cynicism, sar- sarcastic cynicism, quite funny. Yeah, it's what just what it's what makes me laugh. I, I like people who are like that as well. Because I know yeah. I almost like know they're not serious, and I know that they actually love knowing that they're the person who sees the the world through their eyes. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I I I think cynicism is very funny, and I think there's a lot of humor to be found in like you know taking the piss out of out of that type of thing. Yeah, but I also do find there's some benefit to some of it. I wanted to ask you a question. When is your first gig back? Uh, I if if the roadmap thing works out, then looks like uh, is it twenty first of June that things are normal? Twenty first or twenty fourth? Uh, then it could be potentially El Dorado Festival, or there's one in Portugal. With Ed and Camo and Crooked. So one of those, I'm guessing. Um, so I'm keeping all my fingers crossed. What about you? Are you excited to get home and play shows? You must be fucking excited to do that. Yeah, I am. But it's a constant state of switching between the excitement to go home and play shows and then the sadness of having to leave. Yeah. But you're not going to leave forever. No. No. I'll be back. You fucking better not. I'll be fuming. I'll be back. You better, bro. You better come back, bro. <laughs> this is the last time we're going to talk. Today. That, that's it. This is our goodbye. Oh, man. Spending the whole time looking at the fucking... Looking not at each other because we're, we're looking at the monitors. We're not even looking at each other's... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to play shows. and Again, because it's like that feeling, the feeling that I felt in Cologne. Like I, I want that feeling. I want to yeah. feel like I'm a DJ again, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I, I have like a real. Only in the last like month or so, I've developed a bit of, a bit of anxious energy about whether I can remember what to do, and how to like do it. And I'm worried that, like, I'm not. I know that it will just come back like a like muscle memory over a few shows. But I'm worried yeah. that the first few shows, I'm just gonna feel like really like exposed on stage in front of however many people, and just not know what to do. You're gonna <laughs> grab the mic and go, "Hey, my na- <clears throat> hey, <clears throat> hey, my name's Ma- Max Linguistics." Uh, um, uh, everybody put your hands up <laughs> uh, like look, look at Ed and be like, uh. pick it up and pick the mic up and speak into the wrong end or like. yeah just all over the shop I, man I think you'd be fine it's I, just I've, like what the fuck are you doing Max man? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only been a year <laughs> like, <laughs> I've, I've heard you MC recently you poor soul you'd when did be you, fine when did you hear me MC recently we did some MC when um <laughs> when we've seen each other we do MC a lot that's what we do I'm trying to imp- I'm trying to improve my MC skills but like you know you've got it, it it's in you it's in your blood it's just yeah. like riding a bike and I'm sure if you go to, if it shows like all if it's open and it's all good it'll be like think how fucking excited you're gonna be yeah. to walk out on stage and the first time you greet those people you're gonna be like what the fuck is up El Dorado first of all yeah it's gonna be mad yeah, it's. Oh, yeah, I'm just hoping it can happen sooner rather than later. But it will happen when the time is right, when it's safe, and that's the most important thing. Everyone needs to be safe doing it. I just don't want to go back into another one of these flipping lockdowns. Yeah, I I really believe that the vaccines are going on a good pace. I what I think will probably happen is that festivals. There was talk of festivals doing like vaccine passports. So if you had a, a if you had a vaccine, you could go. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's the 
route of getting things open more or like clubs having rapid tests so if you've yeah flow testing to protect right. people yeah so i think that would be that means that things can go back to normal quicker yeah potentially man i just I, I can't wait to like the first party yeah and being like looking around and yeah sharing a cigarette with a stranger and contracting COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you think pe- people are going to be way more careful about, Mate, oh, can I have yeah. a sip from your bottle? You'd be like, N- no, of course you can't. I don't know if you've been yeah. near any bats. Like, <laughs> ab- man, absolutely. Like, I, can't, I cannot believe the things that we used to do. Yeah, what's, like, what's one thing that we used to do that you just can't believe that we used to do? Sharing cigarettes. Yeah. I, I For me, I think, like, that's got to be, like, people would often say, like, oh, can I have, have a draggy cigarette? I'd be like, yeah, sure. Or you'd share a cigarette with a friend or, like, mm. sharing drinks. Yeah. It's mostly just things that you're putting in your mouth. I don't know why. I was, <laughs> why did I? <laughs> I know why you did. Because you're a fucking juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! One one day I'll grow up. One day. <laughs> never. No, don't grow up. No, it's that. It's that. That's that silly energy that keeps you young. I want to grow up in certain ways. I don't want to grow up in other ways. What way do you want to grow up in? Emotionally, probably. I I feel like I've. I think you've grown up emotionally, though. Yeah, yeah. No, I have, but I've not emotionally. <laughs> emotionally, I'm old. I'm like Yoda. No, I'm joking. Uh, no, I don't know. I think probably emotionally, I still have some. I still have some growing to do. Um, mainly spiritually, I need to be more woke <laughs> and understand that my eyes are one of a kind. What do you What do you think your um, biggest uh, <laughs> emotional weakness? <laughs> <laughs> Um, or something that you're you're conscious that you're working on um, I don't know I think I think emotionally this is this is this isn't really emotional but it's I'm I'm trying to make better decisions and create better habits that's been my main thing from Mm -hmm. the beginning of this year and there's uh, like I've really, really, really tried to focus on better habits and sticking to them because I've been. We've spoken about this before. Like we're we're pretty bad at sticking to stuff that mm. we know, even when we know it's good for us. Yeah. Um. So I've tried to. Yeah, that's something I've been focusing on a lot. So there's loads of I've got loads of new habits that I've adopted that I've managed to stick to. How are the How are you finding them? since you begin because you know we're like three mm. we're two and a half months in yeah I mean there's so there was at the beginning I was I did like dry jan and stuff like, stuff like that um, so that that was that was kind of part of probably just that was probably part of the the building of discipline for me because yeah. I've never done I've never really done dry jan or anything like that mm-hmm. um, so that 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 served as like a, a a way to test my my self discipline, but longer term, um, I wanted to stop watching my laptop screen before I went to bed. I just used to watch fucking Netflix and Family yeah. Guy and stuff, and then fall asleep super after you sleep. So I stopped doing that. I wanted to journal before I, before I went to bed, um, and I wanted to um, to read when I got up in the morning, right before mm-hmm. I checked my phone. Um, and the reading, the reading before I went, um, the reading when I get up in the morning is the is the one that's really stuck. And I really mm-hmm. now I like it's the first thing I think about when I wake up is like, oh, sick! I can just go and read and read in the living room for a bit. That's one that's yeah, that that's one that's really helped. So there, yeah, there are three things that have I've actually managed to stick to them. Um, there are a few other things like making to do lists that I kind of wanted to. Ad- to do but I think I was trying to do too much at once I think I might try and adopt the to-do list thing further down the line I still do it like when I remember to do it but it's not quite a habit a habit is you know when you do something naturally without even thinking about it the other things are just natural things now that I do yeah 
it's a surefire way to not continue a habit is to try to do 10 habits at once. Yeah. Whereas if you do, if you just choose one, once that one becomes an actual habit, then you can easily take on another one. And as you build your cache of habits, they become a lot easier to kind of take on. I'd, n- I'd never like, um, someone, someone recommended to me, I read um, Atomic Habits, but I, mm-hmm. I think his name is James Clear. I started reading that when I was, was at like literally the same day. That was, that was the book that I started reading every morning. Um, and it breaks down like the logic of how we perform, how we um, develop habits and how we stick to them. And I'd never thought about it to such a deep level um that 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 book explained to me and it's it made it it made it so much easier to stick to, to stick to them um mm. and yeah and one of them is yeah you don't don't try and change too much too soon because you you won't stick to any of them um so yeah it's better to to get to get a couple down and then if there's other things you want to implement into your life then do it as and when you need to yeah no, that's exactly right. I've I um you actually bought me that book. And I Yeah, have, I did. You haven't read yet, it. I have yet to start reading it. Oh my god, Jono. Which is the worst habit of them all. What? Um <laughs> uh, no, just I haven't started because I'm trying to finish off um I finished my fiction books that I that I've read and now I'm trying to f- finish a small non-fiction book that I bought before that one, but really that's just a form of procrastination, I think. I could just sit down and easily read one chapter today. I feel like stuff doing the start of doing stuff is always the hardest part. Absolutely. That sounds like a dumb thing that a woke person would say. The start of doing stuff is <laughs> the hardest stuff to do. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's one of the dumbest is. things I've ever... Holy <laughs> just fuck <kidding>. that. <laughs> I, I thought it was saying but, something super, <laughs> super. But it's true. It's true. Yeah. Like st- starting something, like you know, f- for our runs, the hardest part is yeah. making the decision to put on your shoes and going out there. Once you're running, it's easy. Essentially, like it, it gets worse just, for me. Uh, you just got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's easier when I'm not with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. And uh, they're not particularly important to me at all. And yeah, I can't wait to stop running with you. In fact, let's stop this. Are we done? Yeah, we're d- we're done. I'm not going to yeah. cry when you leave or... I'm definitely not going to cry. I'm definitely not going to cry right now. I'm not going to cry when you leave or go on runs and buy two, dot, two donuts instead of one and give, sit with a pigeon and pretend it's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I know what I'll do. Uh, there's a manic. There's like a um a cardboard cutout of me in Perth at the moment. So maybe I should just build a cardboard cutout of me that, that can stay here. Yeah. Why do you have a cardboard cutout of you in Perth? Um, GF made one for a show last year. <laughs> so like I could be there. And then he took you. Took you. <laughs> yeah, took us to the show. That's, and now it just lives. It lives man. in my parents' house, and that is love, right there. That is such love. My parents like talk to it and stuff. No way. That's yeah. That's, mum puts it in. It's just sitting in the like in the kitchen. But mum will like sometimes position it in the kit. Um, oh man, like, at the bench and just kind of chat to it and chatter away. That's that's such a deep, like, and prolific. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's such a strong like representation of what love looks like. A mum sat having a dinner looking at a picture of her son who's in another country. Yeah. That's that's a that's pretty powerful imagery right there, the way I'm f- picturing it in my head. Because it's you know, I think it's I need to talk to her about it more, but I think it's had like a pretty positive impact. Um the, on the her, couple cars. Mom, yeah. Because like me and my mum have kind of quite deep conversations and I think that's one aspect of our relationship she's probably missed a bit with me being here (laughs) to move away from the cardboard cutter. Um, Do you find writing lyrics and writing your rhymes to Mm. be either therapeutic or something that has to, that just comes naturally, you just have to get it out and sometimes it doesn't necessarily have so much deep and um, 
emotional uh, roots in your in your mind. It's just more like I've just got this thing in my head that I need to get out. I think it's a combination of the two, depending on the type of song. I mean, it's always a form of expression and like a release to me. Mm. I always feel like a weight lifted if I've if I if I write if I write something that I'm happy with. I always feel I feel lighter as a person and feel feel happier. Mm. Without a doubt, writing writing has always been my therapy. Always, ever since I was fourteen when I started, it was I started writing when things were. Well, I can just hear your side, your throat. <laughs> <laughs> just before you start to tell me about your writing, it's like your my writing's my therapy. It's like really important to me. It was like, just... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, it's cool. Um, yeah, like ever since I was young, when I first started on, I was like fourteen. Writing was. It was it was a way I dealt with problems that were happening. Well, not yeah, I, problems probably the wrong wrong word. But uh, my my parents had split up. I'd moved schools. It, it was uh, I was in a pretty hard. I was in a pretty difficult place as a kid um, mm. when I found writing, and I have no doubt it was a it was a form of a way for me to express my anger in a way that was productive and useful to me rather than go out and fight and, well, not, yeah, go out and get into trouble and, yeah, just not, yeah, just do things that weren't weren't good for my progress as a, as a, as a young man. Yeah. So, yeah, without a doubt, writing is, writing is my therapy and always has been since. You're older now. Thanks. You're probably less angry. Yeah, I guess. Do you oh. feel <laughs> Do you feel that like what's what's motivating you now? Or is it now just a habit? It's a, it's a habit. It's also deeply ingrained as a part of what we, like what we we're talking talking about earlier. It's deeply ingrained as a part of who I am and who I see myself as a person. I'm I'm I I write lyrics and I write songs and that's that's what I've spent years of my life trying to trying to do. Mm. So it's you know it's it's even deeper than that now. It's it, it is me. Everything everything I put out has a re- is is a reflection of me and who I am. And and it goes it's for me personally it goes so much deeper than just what the words are. It's because it's it's the it, it's like the the ex, the experiences I've had in my life to get to that point where I put that on a page. It's the it's the the anxiety and the vulnerability that I that I find personally really difficult. That is necessary to be able to put that out to the world. Um. And yeah, so it's it, it for me. It's more way more than just a song. It's like a little bit part of me that's that's going to be put out, and you know, it'll be it'll be there forever, which is amazing. Which is probably one of the things I love about art so much, uh, whether it's music or film or whatever. I, I love I love the fact that you can put something out to the world, and it can be there forever, no matter what people think of it. That's irrelevant to me. Um, it's yeah, that's that's what my music is to me. It's like a record of your vulnerability. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's um well that's just a personal aspect. I don't know if everyone ha- everyone feels that way or feels that way about it. Maybe they do. I think quite a lot of people do. It takes a lot of guts to be able to put anything out to the world because it's mm. it's personal, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a showing of a lot of things. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a piece of a lot of a lot of me. Do you think this upcoming EP is your most personal stuff to date? Yeah, I think there's I, all all of my releases in the past have always have like stories about me or um, you know my experiences. Um, the EP we're doing, I think I think we're probably going to do singles, but they've they're all pretty different. Like the one with um, 
the document one tune is like very kind of reminiscent of that feeling when you're in a, I don't know, I was kind of imagining like being in a fe- being in a studio, uh, being in a field at a festival again. So that's the kind of vibe on that one. The one was, um, well, other people, I don't know if I, was, <laughs> I, don't, I haven't released them out of the world yet, but like and they're all, they're all really actually quite different tunes. And some of them, some of them contain really deep, really deep personal stories about, about, you know, my, um, my family and uh one of them is actually like a, a letter to my younger self which is that was quite deep to write but I actually wrote that re- quite a while ago there's a lot of personal stuff in there and there will always will be I find it really difficult to write like abstract like random um like stuff that just come comes out of nowhere like I, I, I don't get how people do how people do that yeah um, I, I like some of my some of some of my songs will be about one s- situation that happened in in my life and experience I have. Other songs will be based around multiple different experiences I had and emotions I've had through through my life, and that will make up the song. Um, so yeah, it 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 depends, but it's all it's all personal, yeah. Sorry, that was such a fucking long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that's good. It's good to, to give long-winded answers. Like, I don't. I mean, this is not an interview, but I, I mean, these are just things that I'm fascinated mm. with about you and your process because I'm not. I mean, you're like lyrics man, and I'm the opposite of a, a lyrics man. But I imagine it's just a different tool of expression, like the way you, the way you put across your sounds. That's still. a a, a form of expression and I imagine yeah. I imagine that the feeling I get when I write and after I've written is very, I imagine you get the same thing and like just because and it like I imagine like an artist who's painting something would get a, a similar thing I feel like creating creation of art the the feeling afterwards is probably quite similar no matter what that is absolutely you can it's the same feeling mm-hmm. between doing a drawing making a song Really, what it is, it's like getting out of the, getting out of your own way, and yeah. it's not thinking, and just it's pure expression. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't express myself through lyrics, or I'm not attracted to that because you have to actually put it into words. Like even in the way I, in which I produce, like I produce in a very kind of organic, kind of like vomity way Mm -hmm. and then the song is kind of revealed to me as I move pieces around sure rather than um kind of from the outset being like okay I've got this plan Mm. and in doing it quite succinctly so so yeah I mean any kind of expression any kind of creative expression is Leaves you feeling that kind of deep satisfaction. I think it's like it's a part of your brain. It's the part of the brain that you access when you're in creative creation mode. I yeah. think it's just it's the same for everyone. You just get in. You get into a zone, and yeah, you know that. You know what it feels like. Like yesterday when I was writing, I got into a, like a real like like flow, and I like. I now I always do. I remind myself, like, oh, you're in the you're in the zone. Like, this is this is remember what it feels like to get like this. Mm. Like, so that you can always get into it. But I mean, obviously, we all know it doesn't work like that. It's it can come and go, and it can happen or not happen. Have you read um, the War of Art? The War? No, I haven't. It's by a guy called Stephen Pressfield, and he talks about a bit about flow and about the resistance that we feel and how uh, he, t- he talks about like the muse mm-hmm. and how you're kind of like inspiration and basically how it applies to creation. And he, um, there's a quote in it by a famous author. I can't remember his name, but he says, so it's by a, a writer called William Faulkner. Um, and he says, I only write when I am inspired Fortunately, I'm inspired at nine o'clock every morning. So the idea is that you sit down and you do the work. And when you do the work, the muse comes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The muse only comes when you do the work and you, that's how you get into the flow. So uh-huh. you kind of just have to sit down and start. Like, you know, I, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I'm not really feeling like working on music and I sit down and work on music, it takes me just, it takes me a bit longer to get to that point where I'm in flow. Yeah. But I usually always get there. Sometimes it's three hours, sometimes it's five hours, but mm-hmm. eventually you get to a spot and you're like, yeah, okay, things are, now I'm creating, now I'm things are coming together and I'm seeing uh, the synchronicities in the art that I'm, that I'm making. Yeah. I mean, I suppose that's like, um, yeah, it makes so much sense. That definitely resonates with me. It's, it's all part of, it's all part of the process. Um, yeah. You know, that like the, the kind of frustration that you might feel at the beginning when it's not really happening, that, that part that frustration in itself is part of, is creating because it's, yeah. it's part of, it's part of the process. I mean, to be honest, mate, it's, it's it's really rare that I I mean I, to be honest I can't actually think of the last time I literally sat down and just, I heard something sat down I was like right I'm like right I'm gonna write now sat down put a beat on and just gone boom and done it like, I don't think I've ever done that there's always a kind of you know yeah hour or you know half an hour to an hour maybe 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 slightly more some days yesterday it took me about two hours to yeah I was flicking through beats and different genres and. It, like nothing, nothing was happening, and then it wasn't until, you know, when I was, I kind of use, I kind of usually try and shut off at like six o'clock each day, just to try and give myself a bit of structure. But it was like six thirty, and then something came, and then I just wrote solidly, like wrote for like you know half an hour when I had that good creative flow in me, and that mm-hmm. part of my brain was was rolling, and then I and then I was ha- and then I was happy, and then that's. But that's that's how it can go sometimes, you know. You have two and a half, two hours of nothing, and then an, a half an hour of of great. But that's all. That's kind of all I need for it to feel worth it. Yeah, and if you have half an hour of greatness mm. three times a week, after a month, mm. you have some really good stuff. You'll have a few songs, or you'll have one really good song, or you'll have you'll have something. That's why things with creativity takes so much time you know people people want to be like really good really quickly all the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah unfortunately totally. even the best the best people you know you, yeah they have to do a lot of work jeff told me the other day that quincy jones and michael jackson wrote maybe over 200 songs for wow thriller <sighs> And like they're like two of the best songwriters in the entire world. Yeah. And still that's 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 how much work they do to chisel down to get to a solid fucking great well, it's album. It's like it's like cleaning the pipes, isn't it? You have to just for every amazing song there's you know hundreds and hundreds of terrible ones. Yeah. Well not terrible terrible but like hundreds of ones that don't see the day. A lot of day, and that's just that's that's just a fact of it, all, isn't it? Um, it's just part of the process. It's part of it, and I think like I'm learning to view the to view that the frustration part as part of it now. Yeah, and not not just give up straight away. Like I, that's partly why I wouldn't haven't released music for so long. It's just I got actually got bored of not bored. Not well, yeah. I suppose I got too frustrated with with writing and just wasn't writing anything that I was happy with. Um. Until you know, midway through, well, I suppose beginning of last year, and then I started to 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 get to get back into it a bit more. Mm. Um, but yeah, you gotta enjoy the process. You do, and I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed this process. I've Max. enjoyed this um, process so much. I, you know, I love talking to you, and I love you as a friend. Thank you for for coming on and chatting to me about all sorts of different things when Jeff wasn't available. It's been a pleasure. Um, it has been an actual pleasure. I can't actually believe I'm on the podcast. Um, no, it's been a, it's been an honour. And yeah, next time we'll get Jeff to be here as well. Yeah, Love we'll to do a three-way. Yeah. The second three-way we've done. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Can't keep it out of the gutter too much here at uh, a band of part with our <laughs> and uh, linguistics. Sidetrack and linguistics. Tell everyone what they can do to support your new release. You can go to... When's this coming out? This should come out on Friday. On Friday. So the day of the release, it will be today you're listening to this. So you can go and listen to it. It's called Our Time featuring Document One. It's on Shogun Audio. And yeah, I hope you all enjoy it. And yeah, there's loads of music coming this year, which I can't wait for people to hear. What's uh, your social media? It's I Am Linguistics on everything, I think. Yeah, everything. That's a pretty clean... Yeah. Clean way to do things. So people seem to struggle with how to spell linguistics, but maybe it's yeah, just promote. It's G W X Linguistics. Linguistics Linguistics. Yeah, that's it. MC Linguistics. Max. I love you. I love you too, bro. It's been a pleasure. Farewell. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on your podcast app and keep up to date with all new episodes. They're going to be coming out once a week. We are Echo and Sidetrack on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, On Twitter, we are Echo Sidetrack. Go listen to our music on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, YouTube, or wherever your ears consume happiness. Lots of love, people.